So a really fascinating interview popped up about two weeks ago, which I did want to talk about this for LTPS at the time, but that show was really long, so I put it off, so here we are. Normally, I don't like being this late with what I consider pertinent news items, uh, but we're doing it now, and that is this interview with Mark Cerny speaking with Christopher Drang of GamesIndustry.biz. Uh, Mark Cerny, of course, the PlayStation system hardware architect for the PS4, PS4 Pro, uh, PlayStation Vita as well. I think a lot of people don't realize he was involved with Vita, uh, also PlayStation 5, and we safely assume PlayStation 5 Pro and PlayStation 6 at some point. And so Mark uh, very rarely does public speaking, uh, more so that's always tied to hardware announcements uh, and really with interviews, he just rarely does any kind of speaking. So whenever he does talk, it's always worth paying attention to. And he goes over a number of topics in this uh, interview. So we'll just kind of go over the entire thing. And um, I'll leave it linked below so you can check out the entire thing. There is more that we can't necessarily go over, but uh, I do like how they're opening with Mark's more personal gaming habits because he does uh, shed some light on this occasionally on his own personal Twitter account where he does like to play a lot of games and platinum stuff himself. So uh, he does talk about right now how he's playing Animal Well and he just platinumed Neon White which he does say despite his 42 year career in games, he's always been a player and he gravitates towards games that are trying something new. Uh, but going into more industry talk, he does mention and reflects on the industry, how those who tend to have long careers in it, they should ideally be trying to do more roles, right? If you're going to be doing decades in the games business, try to fill out a lot of different roles. He uses Amy Henning as an example here where she's been a writer, an animator, an artist, and a director. And for himself, uh, being more on the technical side, he's been a programmer, designer, or producer, executive producer, game director, and now a system architect. Uh, Cerny was also asked about what surprised him so far about this console cycle as PlayStation 5 is about halfway through its life now. And Cerny said that uh, what really surprised him was the use of ray tracing, which for them was a, a very late decision when adding that to the console. He was surprised that games were using this on day one as he expected it might be something that is more in the back half or later, uh, later in the life cycle where studios are going to lean deeper into the hardware and extract more out of it. So he says, and I quote here, the other thing that has been surprising is the push to 60 frames per second. Based on previous console life cycles, I would have expected there to be a lot of games that are 30 frames per second only, just because the artwork can be so much more detailed if you have longer time to render it. Instead, the almost universal rule this time around has been the games run at 60. It's great from a play perspective. Gamers overwhelmingly prefer games that are higher frame rates. I just didn't expect such a departure from previous generations. One really interesting aspect of this interview was Cerny touching on the time it takes to make larger AAA games, which we just mentioned for Sean Layden talking about this during the Summer Game Fest uh, IGN panel and also another separate games industry app is uh, interview and discussion with that uh, GI live uh, sprint series of videos. So uh, Mark here mentions that when building a console that takes about four years. So a lot of AAA video game production is actually taking longer than that nowadays, which has been well documented going back to around the mid PS4 cycle to where we are now. Many studios in the AAA space, those games at a minimum take four years, but really five, six, seven plus years is not too uncommon nowadays. And that's despite PS4 and PS5 having a very short window on time to triangle, which is about one to two months. That's the amount of time it takes a studio to get a triangle on screen. PS1, it was about a month, but PS2 took longer. And then PS3, it could take anywhere from six months to a year for a studio to get its engine up and running on the console. That kind of goes back to Cerny's discussion uh, surrounding, well, initially PlayStation 4, then going into PlayStation 5 with those two separate uh, road to PS4 and PS5 discussions. Uh, and we've also mentioned many times how PS2 and PS3 in terms of their system architecture, it's very esoteric and bespoke. And that's why those systems oftentimes have a reputation for uh, being very hard to develop for. But uh, what's funny here is that Cerny says he spends a lot of time on forums and reading comments from people wondering if time to triangle is lower now, why do games still take this long, right? So uh, he says the answer is simply that a lot of studios choose to do this, going for these giant creations that do typically take four to six years. Uh, another really fascinating thing Cerny touches on is console design. He says, and I quote here, one of the exciting aspects of console hardware design is that we have freedom with regards to what we put in the console. Or to put that differently, we're not trying to build a low cost PC and we aren't bound by any particular standards. So if we have a brainstorm that audio can become much more immersive and dimensional, if there is a dedicated unit that's capable of doing complex math, then we can do that. Or if the future feels like high speed SSDs, 
rather than HDDs, we can put an end-to-end -end system in the console, everything from the flash dies to the software interfaces that the game creators use, and get 100% adoption. Cerny then goes on to say that he likes to think these sorts of things end up advancing the industry overall, uh, which in turn benefits PC, since these do become uh, a bit of a, like more mounting pressure for something like direct storage to become more widely adopted. That's the example he's using there. Uh, so this is all kind of leading into Cerny just feeling as though consoles still play a very important role in the consumer ecosystem. He actually references that video from Linus Tech Tips when uh, they try to outperform a PS5 by building a PC for $500. So Cerny actually referred to this video and he said, and I quote, they had to get a used motherboard. That was the only way they could build a PlayStation 5 equivalent for a PlayStation 5 price. And if you're using used parts, well, you can get a used PlayStation 5 for eBay for $300 or something. I think as long as we continue to create that very nice package, the future of consoles is pretty bright. Now, since this interview was also done near Cerny's upcoming 60th birthday, the topic of retirement came up, and Cerny says that while he is thinking about this, he says he still has some time left in the industry. Funnily enough, Christopher Dring says people were probably hoping Cerny would say never, but he instead responds with, well, Clint Eastwood is a pretty good role model. At least the part where he's still directing movies at age 90 or something, not the part where he started a movie with a chimpanzee. So that's actually one angle of this entire thing that I thought was pretty interesting is that they did touch on retirement because I was curious for a bit there with Mark Cerny. I certainly expect him to close out PlayStation 5 Pro and also PlayStation 6 because these things do take quite a long amount of time to, you know, get get going. I mean, I've been thinking, like, I, I don't think he's going to be around for PlayStation 7, right? <laughs> you have to figure with just where he is. Not saying the guy is so old and he can't work, but um, I don't know. I read that quote and I, I think to myself, like, it, it almost sounds like he is saying that, yeah, I, I've got another one in me, like another console generation, because um, that would be for PlayStation 7, especially in the context of this article where they're talking about the relevancy of consoles and Mark outright saying, if we can keep building them the way that we build them, then there should still be value there. So I don't know, in a way, that's that's how I'm reading it, uh, implying maybe that Mark does want to go you know, beyond shipping PlayStation 6, which we expect around 2027, 28. So I don't know, just some, some food for thought there. But I mean, the one thing we can say about Mark is that he's been invaluable to this company, right? Because it was such a very big deal at the time when he did lead the PlayStation 4 architecture and uh, really roadmap for that console to where PlayStation is nowadays, right? Because this is something Mark talked about in that road to PS4 discussion discussion where, you know, he basically asked for that job, right? This was a very Japanese company, Sony, uh, the Sony Corporation, and they never let an American lead the, the hardware team before, but they said, yeah, go ahead and do it since he worked on so many games and he was so uh, intrinsically tied with a lot of the, the first party dev studios working on just, again, all those production roles or, or programming and whatnot. He's just had so many disciplines throughout the games business and also Sony Games, which is his uh, consulting agency. So it's just a, a crazy career for him going back again. 42 years to Atari with coin op. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we can talk about there. But the other angle I want to mention, which I, I found fascinating, was Mark also acknowledging that, like, he's genuinely surprised that we have this many 60 FPS games. The, I feel so validated. That was absolutely something I mentioned plenty of times on LTPS. For the 12 years I've been doing this thing, right, on this on this channel, which is, it's like a big pet peeve of mine is always this, like, sort of argument or case that, uh, you know, consoles can't do 60 FPS or something. It's like, it doesn't matter if it's PlayStation 4 or 5, 3, 2, 1, like 60 frames per second, high frame rates, they're always possible, but game development studios willingly choose to sacrifice frame rate. It's the first thing to go in order to increase visual fidelity. They're closed boxes. It's basically a character slider and studios almost always prefer to well, market visual fidelity, because that's just something that's extremely marketable. So even for PlayStation 5 at the time, 2019, 2018, I'm sure there's plenty of LTPS episodes where I said, like, we're going to have 30 FPS games on this machine, because that's how this has happened every single time. So hearing the system architect also have that same sort of mindset and that we are probably going to see 30 FPS games is is validating. But it's also great to know that we were both wrong because yes, higher frame rates are indeed much better. And uh, I think a lot of that really plays into the cross-gen cycle and you know the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID game delays and how it's just, we're in diminishing returns anyway. So I think for a lot of uh, 
a lot of titles that really just that and also the combo of how many third party publishers, uh, big AAA publishers that can even fund the kind of game that would really push these boxes to the absolute limits, right? If a game is not CPU bound, there's just so many variables at play that kind of in a way actually work against a game that has to be 30 FPS nowadays. Uh, although we are seeing some games finally pop up that are 30 FPS only. Um, and I, I still think, uh, well, Grand Theft Auto 6 might be a title that's 30 FPS only, but either way, I'm also mentioning the Linus Tech Tips video. I mean, I, I audibly laughed when I read that. It's like, I'm sure he always knew about those things, but to hear him acknowledge it is just, <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing to hear, right? Cause that's been like a, a long time, like on the PC side of things on YouTube, there's always uh, plenty of videos going over uh, some sort of PC builds that can try to match or outperform consoles, which, I mean, consoles are closed boxes when they initially ship. Over time, there is going to be that decay where clearly PC parts will, at a certain point, um, match consoles in a way where the price is a bit more equivalent, but the other angle is that simply Sony has economies of scale. So sure, if you want to really boil it down to low cost PCs, it's going to be very hard to ever beat a platform holder. But even then, Mark does talk about how th these machines are still very bespoke in that they can do things like the Tempest 3D audio tech engine uh, or throwing an SSD in every single console, which means they can expect 100% developer adoption. Um, that was why like PlayStation 3 back in the day, that was such a big deal that that console, every single machine shipped with a hard disk drive. That meant as a guarantee, developers could uh, do mandatory HDD installs for that particular game. Uh, also making sure every console has a Blu-ray drive, right? That was another big benefit. So that way full games could ship on a single Blu-ray versus say 360 at the time, right? Uh, not every machine had a hard disk drive. So some games... You know, it was a hard requirement to uh, support memory cards. Not every game had enough space to fit on a single DVD, so there were multiple DVDs. It's just, it's one of those things where we, it's like not a major deal in the grand scheme of things, but you can sometimes boil it down to how important it can be to make sure that the thing you ship on day one has enough there that's going to carry you through the entire platform cycle. So Mark kind of just getting into that as well. But yeah, very fascinating talk. Anytime Mark ever says anything publicly, We'll probably bring it up to some degree and, and go over it. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. And uh, I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.